First and last verse, I feel like traveling on. <clears throat>
requested it, but um, but they requested a good one there. Sister Joyce. Okay, I was wondering who, who requested it. Everybody had a poker face. They were they were um, keeping that to themselves. Well, Sister Joyce, why didn't you go ahead and claim I requested that? <laughs> oh, she didn't know you did. Okay, well, you requested it. Yeah. Man, I love Charles Johnson and Revivers did it in the in the eighties and nineties and. Um, <laughs> sometimes you wait for requests. You know, even with God, sometimes our requests take time for them to be made known to us, right? Uh, but, that's right. So you know, that, but you know, your request was heard. Awesome, though. I love that song, though, because it is so true. We can't walk without holding His hand, especially in our spiritual life. We're going to continue with our study on our focus, and I want to ask you to do something after service tonight. I'll be putting this up on YouTube, and when I put it up on the, I'll put it on the church's page and my page. And if if you um, could share that, because I do want this is for our people in particular. This is. This is a study for our church, and there are some who just can't be here tonight that I want them to see this. I want them to get the opportunity, not because I'm teaching, but because of what it is that I'm teaching. But let me give you a testimony real quick. It probably He probably doesn't want me to put it out there. Weren't we blessed by Jeff Adams um, Sunday night? What a great word he shared. But can I tell you a little bit about that? Anytime we have a guest speaker come, we always want to give them an honorarium, give them an offering of some sort. And, and um, you know, it's, it's something we, we believe we should do. And before service, Brother Adams told me, now we had never met just by phone, uh, which is unusual for me to have somebody, but, I, but God laid him on my heart so much. And, and, um, and so he told me, he said, look, he said, I, I, I need to talk to you first. I don't know what he's going to say, but he said, I cannot take anything um, for doing this service. I said, and he used the term reconsider. You know, I remember seeing him use reconsider so much a Sunday night. And so I asked him after service, will you reconsider this? And um, he said, he, he told me why, and I understood. So what I asked him to do is if, we, if, if, if he wouldn't allow us to give him an honorarium, then, because he had, he had absolute spiritual reasons for not doing that. I said, would you allow us to send it um, to World Missionary um, so we can, because we do, I do believe we should sow. And so um, that, that honorarium was sent today to the World Missionary that we're supporting now, who is going to now have to have gallbladder service, or surgery, excuse me. And, and so, um, so still yet, God, uh, through, through his kindness, we were able to send more this month to the World Missionary that we would normally send. And I, and I think that's an awesome thing. And so there's a blessing. We were blessed with the word, and there's also somebody who's getting blessed um, that's going to help, and we're going to continue. And God's going to bless us for supporting world missionaries. Don't you believe that? Um, especially this particular missionary that we're supporting. Um, but I want to talk to you tonight as we talk about our focus. We talked last week about the focus of reach. And again, um, and, and we talk about our focus. Um, our church exists. This is why we exist. This is, in fact, this is why every church should exist, is to reach non-believing people of all ages. Don't we believe that? What, what does that mean? That means we're supposed to try to reach people who are lost. And the church should never lose its vision for reaching lost people, okay? And it doesn't matter what age group. We talked about that last week. And then we believe to connect them with other Christians, to help them grow in faith, and to challenge the growing to discover their ministry and honor God with their life. Now, we want to talk tonight, we talked last week about what it means to reach people. Tonight I want to talk about to connect. And so each one of these that I'm going to be sharing with you is going to be, I'm going to be sharing, I'm going to be breaking down that particular word and giving each letter a meaning. It's one of those things that I don't do all the time, but I like doing with this particular thing because we're going to talk about connect. You know, when we think of the word connect, that's a huge word today in church. So many churches, they have what they call connect groups and or we're going to connect people. And, you know, when I grew up, I don't remember us using the word connect in that way. When I thought, when I used the word connect growing up, it was connecting the dots or connect four, um, you know, games that we played or something like that. But now connect has become something so different. But it really is true. And in and, and, and Christianity, in our faith, we are supposed to be connected to one another. 
And I, and I really believe that. I, you know, as a church body, we are connected to each other. And, and, and we run as a connection to each other. You know, like I told you earlier, how I got, um, I got connected to a hot wire yesterday. And it hurt, okay? I'm not going to lie to you, it hurt. I had to get it come off the ladder for a minute and shake it off. How many of you ever watched Tim the Tool Man on Home Improvement? That was me yesterday. I mean, I had to, I had to walk around and shake it off just a little bit. Um, and, and so uh, I don't think you were around, brother, any when that happened. But boy, it, 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 it bit me good. And, and um, But as, as I've worked with that, and I've worked with electricity a lot in my life, and um, it's one of the things I, I kind of like to, I, I enjoy working with electric, electric stuff. But one of the things that happens with electricity is electricity only runs because of connection. I mean, if you lose connection, in fact, one of the reasons I, I, I there was, we, Brother Mike and I were working on a light over, over here on Monday. And when I, when I tied one together, the other one didn't come on. And I thought, hmm. And then I looked, the connection was loose. The, the, because the connection was loose, it didn't, it didn't work. In fact, because the connection was loose with one wire, it caused several of them not to work. And every one of these lights on this trough are run into the same connection. In fact, they're connected to those lights over there. That's why I can use one switch to turn every one of those lights on. It's because of a connection. And I think we have to have that kind of connection when it comes to the kingdom, doesn't it? Isn't that what God wants for us? He wants us to have a connection that, you know what? I can't run spiritually if, I don't, if I'm not connected to you. And you can't run spiritually if you're not connected to me. Yeah, we're supposed to be connected to God, but we've got to be connected to one another. And so to connect is incredibly important. And, 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 and again, that's why fellowship is important. And we think, oh man, fellowship, that means the cookout or that means having food. That's not fellowship, folks. That's just eating and getting fat. Come on, let's be honest. You can say amen to that. We always, it seems like that the only fellowship that people in church have had for years is over food. And, and the reality is, um, that's nice. It's good to have times of fellowship with food. But I have greater, fe I, I had great fellowship on Monday with Brother Mike while we were working on those lights. I had great fellowship yesterday with you, Brother Eddie, while we were working on these lights. That, you know, that's just as much fellowship as sitting down and having a meal together. And none of us took a break to eat, did we? <laughs> They learned real quick, I don't take breaks to eat. And so um, I, and I just, you know, I just keep going. And, and so it's, it's one of those things that, that I, I love that fellowship. I love the fellowship that I have. You know, um, some, sometimes Brother Frankie and I, we work together. Some of our best fellowship is when we're on lawnmowers together. Um, and, and, well, we're not on the same lawnmower. We don't do that. Uh, but when we're on two lawnmowers dueling in the, in the yard and, and we're fellowshipping, mowing the church lawn or, or somebody else's lawn or something like that, and we're, we're doing that. There, there's a great fellowship um, that, that, that happens um, in, in, in those types of things. And so don't, don't lock fellowship into sitting down at a table. There's so many great ways to fellowship, and in kingdom people in the church, we've we got to figure out ways to fellowship. In fact, Jesus said it this way. He said it in John 17. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. Before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed. Do you know who he prayed for when he, before he went to the cross? He prayed for us. If you read John chapter 17, Jesus didn't spend that time praying for himself as much as he spent that time praying. Five times in John chapter 17, Jesus prays for the church to be one. Five times. So that tells you that it is really important for the church to be one body of believers, right? That, that, that we're to be that one. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So he's praying for the church that's going to exist then. But then he's also praying for those who's going to come along later, which is us. That's us, okay? And he says, that they, and, and he says just as you are in me and I am you, may they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. So we're all in Christ, right? Every one of us are Christians. If you're a Christian, say I'm a Christian. All right, I've heard three of you. If you're a Christian, say, I'm a Christian. Say it. Use your voice, okay? Say, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. All right. Now, if you're watching online, say, I'm a Christian, okay? I'm, I'm going to find out if some of these people watch. All right? Then, the, so if, 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 they, if they do that, you know, when, when it's the, 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 that being a Christian part, one of the great things that we're in Christ, right? I'm in Christ. He's in me. I mean, that, that, that's part of it. But Jesus goes farther than this. He says, not only are you in me, 
And me and you, he says this, he says, because of this, and this is my prayer, he said, that you will be in each other. Isn't that powerful? He's telling us we have to connect. We need to connect. That the people of God are supposed to connect. That's why when I hear somebody say that they, that, that they can serve God without any other person, I find that to be just one simple word answers that. Hogwash. It's unbiblical. God never designed us to be alone. There, there are times that we have aloneness that we're supposed to be or set apart times. But he designed us to be with other Christians. That we're supposed to be with each other. I know some people are shy. Some people don't. Some some people have a harder time. Some people have, you know, these days social anxiety and things like that. But folks, God designed us to be together. He designed the people of God to be together. In fact, He designed us to be together in such a way. He said, "Don't be yoked. Uh, be unequally yoked." And you know, we've heard being unequally yoked people talking about that they use it for things to separate race, and that's not what that's about. That's separating believers from unbelievers. And the reality is, my greatest fellowship, I have people who are friends who are unbelievers, but my greatest fellowship are with my friends and brothers and sisters who are believers. I think every single one of you, I've been able to sit down and talk to every single one of you for different things. And because of that, we can be believers together. And I enjoy, we have different kinds of conversations. If I want to have a conversation with Brother Ricky and I, we were talking about his shirt earlier today. I mean, he's got a cool shirt on today. Other than it being the front-facing hog. I'm still not down with the front-facing hog, but, you know, Ricky has a good Razorback shirt on. Other than the front-facing hog, I still like the side-facing hog, okay? Um, but, you know, um, you know, Sister Etal, we, we may sit down and talk to her about, about some of the hymns or something like that that, that she's going to do or, or, um, or you know, hey, uh, Cadence, can we borrow your side by side or something like that, you know, and watch her take us someplace with it. Or, or Brother Mike and I, we may be sitting there talking about some revival or something like that. Or, or Sister Joyce and, and Brother Elmer, we may, we may be talking about, probably talking about the Green family of some sort, you know. <laughs> and, um, uh, or some fellowship like that, or, 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 or Brother Eddie, we may talk about some of the old days, because we go way back, don't we, Brother Eddie? Yes, sir. We go way back. Um, way back when we both had more hair. And so, um, you know, we have all those things. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, all the, we, we, we have different ways of fellowshipping, okay? There's different ways. You know, Brother Don and I, we may go back and talk about going and seeing the first movie we ever saw together. Remember what that was? Iron Man. It was Iron Man. And, um, and so way back in 2008, you know, remember those things. I mean, it, all those things are fellowship that we have, okay? And it's so important. In fact, another part of fellowship we find in Hebrews 10, what does the author of Hebrews tell us? He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, we focus on verse 25 where he tells us, let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves as the matter of some is. But verse 24 is just as important. He says we're supposed to spur one another on to love and good deeds. And so he tells us as people of God that we're supposed to spur each other on, aren't we? Do you know what it means to spur somebody on? When we find a brother or a sister who's starting to get way back. Now I've never, I haven't ridden horses too much, but some people who ride horses a lot have spurs on them. And they kick that horse with a spur. What does it do? It keeps that, keeps that horse going, right? Makes that horse giddy up. And sometimes we have to spur each other to giddy up and go. That's part of the job of a pastor. But as part of the job as a Christian, sometimes we have to spur each other on. It means we have to keep cheering each other on and encouraging each other. And that's what connect means. Now I'm going to hurry with this and, and bring us to, I'm going to break down connect into, into each different letter. So let's look at connect. What's it start with? It starts with a C, okay? So if I'm going to connect with other brothers and sisters in Christ, if I'm going to connect with the people in the church, the, the C automatically runs to my mind is the word cooperation. How many you know that cooperation is incredibly important? Isn't it funny that we teach children to cooperate with each other, right? We teach them in school to cooperate with each other, to share and things like that. But cooperation is not something that they, that, that's rarely talked about in church. But in kingdom work, that cooperation is important. In fact, 1 Corinthians, Paul said, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. Did you know if your body parts aren't cooperating with each other, it's going to really mess you up, isn't it? It really will. 
We know what it's like when certain body parts stop cooperating, right? We call that old age. Because certain things don't, don't cooperate. My knees don't cooperate with the rest of my body like it used to. Sometimes my mind don't cooperate with the rest of my body. My mind still thinks I'm 24 years old. I mean, my, my mind still thinks I'm 24. And then I look in the mirror and I think, man, your mind, what a terrible thing to waste. I mean, I, you know, it's not, I'm not 24 year, years old anymore, and I can't do some of the things I could do when I was 24. Folks, I'm not going to lie to you. When I was 24, you know what I could do? When I was 24, I could slam dunk a basketball 24 years old. Yes, I could. When I was 28, I could do that. I'm 51 years old. I'm still holding on to 51 for the next three months. I'm 51. And guess what? I can't dunk a basketball anymore. I'd be afraid to even attempt to do that. I'd go out there. These kids want me to walk and play basketball with them outside. And I say, do you want to see me laying on the ground crying like a baby? I said, because if I try to jump, I'm going to hit my, my knees going to go down. And I'm going to, be, I'm going to be on this ground crying like a baby. I said, I can't do that. My body doesn't cooperate with those things anymore. So I have to find out what my body cooperates with, don't I? And in the church, we, need, we have to have a cooperation. That means everybody has a place. Not everybody can do the same thing. You know, it would be foolish if everybody got up in the church and preached. You can't have everybody in the church be a preacher. They can't. Why? Not everybody in the church can be a singer. Not everybody in the church can be an usher. Not everybody in the church can be a Sunday school teacher. Not everybody in the church can, 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 can be the, the, the janitor. Not everybody in the church can do it. But guess what? Everybody in the church can find something. In fact, we need something. And we need more people desiring to do things so that, so that not one, one or two people are doing all the things because that's where we need cooperation. It is important. If God is going to give us the revival that he has called us to, that he has spoken to us, then we have to understand that everybody has to do their part. Even when it comes to praying with people, guess what, folks? I don't need to be the only person praying with people on the altar. We need more people that have a hunger for praying with people. Now, we don't need anybody being cuckoo or anything like that. And I mean, there are more people out there that are cuckoo that will pray crazy stuff over folks, and we have to watch that. But at the same time, there are people who are equipped to intercede and to pray for others. And, and guess what? God doesn't put healing in my hands. He's got healing in his hands. And he, he says, call on the elders of the church. Folks, guess what? That doesn't mean the old folks. That means people who are mature in Christ to pray and lay hands on folks. And some of you are mature in Christ and you can lay hands on folks. It's funny, when the ladies have their ladies' prayer meeting, they don't call me in here to pray. Why? Because y'all know the power of prayer, right? Y'all don't need the pastor to come in and pray. Now, there have been times where they've called me in for certain things to pray, but, but they are able to pray. Well, I, I believe that those ladies have the power and authority to call down heaven on people's lives. Or else we wouldn't have a ladies' prayer meeting, would we? But thank God we have it. But my, my point is... Guess what? It can be more than in the ladies' prayer group. Some of those ladies can be laying hands on people in the altar because there are plenty of ladies that need ladies laying hands on them. Come on now. I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. This is true. We have to have that. But cooperation in so many different ways. There's so, find that thing that say, you know what I can do? Well, I'm too old. Nobody's too old to serve God. And we're not too old to cooperate for the kingdom. Second thing, if we're going to have connect, we have C. What's the next letter? O. Orientation. Now, years ago when I came up with this, the word orientation didn't have the meaning that it had today. Now, when we say orientation, people start getting all in an uproar about it. Please don't go there with your mind, okay? We're not talking about gender orientation, sexual orientation, stuff like that. I'm talking about what it means to have orientation in the church. And it is a key word. We don't think it is. You know what orientation really means? It means instruction. It means instruction, being taught, people willing to be taught. Here's what the psalmist said about orientation. He said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Guess what? 
The Word of God is our greatest orientation. It orients us to where we need to be. People want to find out about their gender. They'll find it in the Bible. People want to find out about, about, about any of this. They'll find out in the Bible. But guess what? We need an orientation in us. That's why teaching children is so important. I thank God that we are still able to have Sunday school. I thank God for Sunday school. And um, we got people who are faithful to teach in Sunday school. Uh, I, I, guess what, folks? I think that we have Sunday school in the sanctuary, but we have Sunday school in every other room in this building except these offices. On Sunday, we have teachers that teach children, teenagers, young adults are being taught. And the, the key is, do you know what happens in Etal's class? What happens in, 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 in what, 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 what happens in, 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 in their classes is children get taught. I mean, Sister Pat's class, children get taught. What happens in Sister Panky's class, teenagers get taught. What happens in Sabrina's class, young adults and adults get taught. What happens in Brother Jerry's class, they get taught. They get taught. What happens in Sister Kelly's class, they get taught. Even those young kids get taught the Word of God. Isn't that a powerful thing? Because if you put it in them when they're young, there's something that will bless them when they're older. How many of you remember going to Sunday school when you were young? I remember going to Sunday school. I didn't always love going to Sunday school because it wasn't fun to go to Sunday school. I got taught at Sunday school. But there was something powerful about it. And I remember so many things. I remember, I remember my Sunday school teachers putting things in me. They weren't always, that's back when they could spank you in Sunday school, folks. You know, everybody remember when they could spank you in Sunday school? They can't do that now. Can't do that now. But hopefully we don't have to. However, the, the orientation that I have, it put foundations in my life. And we have to have that. And guess what? New people need to be oriented to the kingdom of God. When people come in and give their hearts to the Lord, they get saved. They have to be oriented to the kingdom of God. Because guess what? They sometimes don't know what to, how to dress when they come to church. They, but I don't expect lost people to act like saved folks. But when somebody gets saved, we need to teach them. We need to teach them how to dress. We need to teach them what... Did you know that sometimes folks don't know that it's wrong to cuss? Right? They, how, how do they know it's wrong if, they, if they've done it their whole life? Sometimes it's just part of their language. And so what, we teach them why you speak certain things. You teach them why you do certain things. You know, we're not trying to be rich or anything like that, but you, that's what orientation is. That's, that's what, when you got a new job, didn't they orient you on a new job? When I went to college, my freshman year of college, I walked into Arkansas State University and they had what they call freshman orientation. And I walked in and they did for freshman orientation what they should do for every freshman. They made, made, they made us sit down and watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And they said, I want you to look to the left and I want you to look to the right. One of these people won't be here if you graduate. <laughs> and so, and I was almost one of those people, but I made sure I got through because my first semester was lousy. But that orientation helped teach us some stuff. I wish I had listened more to orientation than watching the movie. But we have to have orientation. The end, there's two ends in the word connect. The first end is networking. Now, networking is a huge word we use today. As Christians, we network. Christians are the greatest network in the history of networks. You know, networking, we think of pyramid schemes and so forth, or we think of business, we think of LinkedIn or Facebook or social media. But networking is more than that. Networking is what we do in the kingdom. What is networking is simply this. In Ecclesiastes, we are told this. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Here's what networking really is. It's, it's me being able to connect with somebody else so that we can do more for the kingdom. The Bible says this, one will put a thousand a flight, two will put 10,000 a flight. So guess what? If you have four, do you know what you do? Anybody, anybody do math? Four people network together, put a million to flight. Now think about that. You don't have to have a network of 100,000. You get a network of four, you're putting, I mean, I mean, think about it. One will put 1,000, two will put 10,000, three will put 100,000, four will put a million. 
What did networking with 120 on the day of Pentecost do? It has put two and a half billion people into the kingdom of God. Now think about that. That's some pretty serious networking, isn't it? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to network with people, intentionally doing that. Another thing is the, uh, another end, right? We have two ends in that, right? This is very simple. The next end is nicely treating others. Now, that, ought to say, that ought to be just a no-brainer, right? Several years ago, we went to Hendersonville, Tennessee for a wedding. Our son was five years old. We went for the wedding because our son was a groomsman, or no, he was the ring bearer in the wedding. As, as Caleb was the ring bearer in this wedding, uh, I was I was just in my preaching. It was in 1997, and I was I was preaching, and I, and so I always wanted to go to church. And we had a church, a church of God, right across the road from 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 Trinity City, you know. And, I, you know, I wanted to see Trinity City because that's where TBN's headquarters was because I loved Rod Parsley and all the people on TBN at that time. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I enjoyed that. Right across the street was the Church of God. So I've got to go to the Church of God. We went to the, the wedding was in the church. Oh, y'all will love this. It was in Johnny Cash's church. All right. Y'all remember Johnny Cash, right? Okay. It was in his church. It was a big church. Sanctuary seated two or three thousand people, and we were, our son was in the wedding on that stage. And we wanted to go to the Church of God on that Sunday morning, so we went and walked into the Church of God that Sunday morning. And me, I'm a young preacher. My wife with me. We got our little boy with us, and we walk in, and we're in the foyer waiting. Nobody spoke to us. There was a couple that we saw that actually was at the wedding, and they 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 came and said something. There's nobody in church leadership. Nobody showed. Nobody told us, they, they didn't, they didn't, I mean, I just assumed they look at me and say, kiss my foot. They didn't say anything to us. They said, oh, you can sit here, you can't sit there. And I, and, and, and I sat down, and the preacher was awesome. The man of God, he preached an awesome word. And we were just, we were strangers in there. They didn't know that we weren't safe. They, they didn't know if we were lost or not. And folks, this is the key. We need to treat people nice all the time. I mean, he says this. Paul said, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. So first of all, we have to be nice to each other. Look around you and just smile. Go ahead. Turn around and just smile. Did you know it is really easier to be nice than it is to be nasty? That you, have to, you don't have to think to be nice to people. You have to think to be nasty to folks. And so we need to, it's easy, but it's easy for me to be nice to you guys. I've been here for 11 years. It's easy for me to be nice to you guys. Earlier today, I was driving my truck back from Walmart. And, um, and man, um, I was getting around the curve where Wendy's is. I was coming around and a lady pulled out right in front of me. And I did, I had to slam on my brakes, you know. My flesh says, insurance, <clears throat> go ahead, you know, T-boning. It's going to be her fault. But then I've been around here long enough to know that a lot of people don't have insurance. It's probably going to fall on mine anyhow. And I just have liability on my truck. And so um, I, won't, I still want to have, so I slammed on my brakes because I really didn't want to be in a wreck because I also don't know if I'm going to survive the wreck or not. And that one hit her and I thought, and, and that woman, she's driving like this. And um, she never looked. I mean, I'm, I'm two feet from her, I almost hit her. It wasn't any of you. I, I, you know, my flesh is lay on the horn. And generally, I'd lay on the horn just to protect her. Some people's flesh goes ahead and does other things. And I just drove on. I said, you know, I don't have an extra drive with that woman. I'm fine. She's fine. I pray that she doesn't pull out in front of anybody else because somebody else might, might slam into her. We've got to be nice wherever we're at. When we go to Walmart and somebody um, leaves their shopping cart out, be nice. You go to you know you go to the restaurant and the food is lousy, be nice. We got to nicely treat people regardless. Or if, if, or, or if you had to wait for a long time, you know what? What if you have to wait for two hours to get your food? Well, enjoy the fellowship that you're with. Be nice. I mean, it, we are called to be nice to not just each other but to the world. What about, are we supposed to be nice to all these people who are doing some of the rotten things? 
in 2010, to me, one of my greatest examples in my personal life of being able to be nice to somebody happened in an automobile accident. And as I was on my way to pick up a little girl for our church service, it was one of our, it was our next to last Sunday that we were going to be at, at, um, at Marion. It was our next to last Sunday there. And I was going to pick up one of Katie Best's little friends, Kim, for church. And, and I was driving Josh's truck because um, it had been in the shop and they had, my vehicle was in Blyville. And so I was driving his truck and, and I'm going in West Memphis and at McDonald's, a lady pulls out in front of me and I did not have time to stop and I hit her. I had a liability on this truck and it was her fault, clearly. She jumps out, she has two little children in the car. I've got to preach that morning it was the last service I was going to get to preach at that church. And, and because my last Sunday, I didn't get to preach. Uh, we had, they had a guest come in and try out for the church. And so I, um, my last Sunday, I'm going to get to preach at that church. Then what happens is my, uh, my son's vehicle is totaled. And the woman jumps out. She says, I have no insurance. I have no insurance. I didn't realize that my insurance agent had put uninsured motors on my, my vehicle. I didn't realize. I didn't know. I just thought, well, I have, she has no insurance. We don't have a truck. And so, but I looked at her and I saw her little kids and I thought they could have been very, they could have been injured. And, uh, and while we were at the scene, I asked the woman, Tanya had to come pick me up. I said, before I leave, can I pray for you? Look, the accident, she didn't pull out in front of me on purpose. She didn't cause a total lot my sister. You know what? I ended up being able to get a good truck out of that. And, um, and, and we were fine. She was fine. And, but I couldn't imagine telling that woman and being ugly to her just because she pulled out in front of me. She didn't do it intentionally. Accidents happen in life. I still, getting to pray with her was a great privilege of getting to pray with that woman because I could have been ugly to her and then went and preached the gospel. But how would that have been? She might have showed up in church. And so folks, we have to learn to do that. It has to be part of connecting. Other part of connecting is the E. Encouraging. I'm not going to go real long into this part. I just want to encourage you that we have to be encouragers. The church is called to be encouragers. He says be strong and courageous. We can't be courageous and strong if we're not encouragers. And guess what? One day I'm going to be down. I need encouragement from time to time. Folks, I'm not going to lie to you. The last year and a half, I've had lots of times I think, man, I've had to change so many things up. Sometimes I have to change things on the fly. You never know if any decision is right. And I do. I need from time to time encouragement. But I also know that you need encouragement from time to time. Every, sometimes you're up. When you're up, encourage somebody else. But when, some, when you see somebody down, you encourage them. Because we all get down and, we are, and we've got to be encouragers to each other. You know what? To me, encouraging is be your brother's cheerleader. Be the greatest cheerleader. Why don't you go ahead and just say, why don't you just cheer everybody on right now? You have people that are sick right now. Let's cheer them on. Let's be encouragers. People who, who, may, be, who, who may watch right now and they're feeling down because they feel like they're missing out on something. Encourage them. Let them know. You guess what? God is still for you. We love you. And we're not going to forget you. Even if you need him. We have a brother who his wife are coming to our church and lost his sister. We need to encourage that brother. We need to covenant. Every Christian needs a covenant with each other. We have a covenant with each other. And this, this is important. Men covenant with men. Women covenant with women. And what I mean by that, if you go to 1 Samuel, and I'm not going to elaborate on it, it says, now Jonathan again caused David to, to, vow, to vow because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. Jonathan and David had a great covenant relationship with each other. It was a brotherhood relationship. They weren't brothers, but they made each other brothers. They had a covenant with each other. And we have to have that co a covenant like that with one another in the kingdom of God. It tells you that, again, when David was down, he had Jonathan. When Jonathan was down, he had David. And so much so that after David became king, because of the covenant he had with Jonathan, what did he do? He blessed Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, who was lame because of when they were running away, the, the servant dropped him and caused his foot to be lame. And that kid ate at the king's table because of the covenant that 
David had with Jonathan. Church folks ought to have a covenant. And then finally, trust. When you connect, you got to trust. I know I talk to you a lot about how we're supposed to trust God. I ne you never hear me say not to trust man. Did you know that when you trust people, you put yourself at their mercy? Sometimes when you trust people, they're going to let you down. It'll happen. But don't stop trusting people, particularly people of God. He says, love suffers long in this kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, uh, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. What that tells me is that if I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, I can trust them. They don't have to be perfect, but I can trust them. I trust you. I trust the people of this church. I trust my kingdom folks. Will I get burned from time to time? Yes, but I'm not going to stop trusting because I cannot connect if I don't trust. And here's a way in trust. What if you tell somebody something in confidence? What do you expect? You should think that it stays in confidence, right? If I tell somebody, please, I'm telling you this, it's not because I... And sometimes there are, did you know, it's not because somebody's done something ugly, but sometimes there are things you just don't want to broadcast everywhere. There's a reason. It's trust. And we have to have that. Why? Because our church exists to reach non-believing people of all ages, to connect them with other Christians. We want to be connected. I want to pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, I pray for these beautiful people, for those who are watching online. God, I pray that you would minister to them, dear God. And we pray that we would be able to connect in very...